So I'm out here on the banks of my favorite trout stream right now. And I wanted to do a quick video while I was thinking about it. Um, just really explaining why your presentation when it comes to fishing in the Southern Appalachians means more than your actual fly pattern. Um, right what I've got here behind me is free textbook of a wild trout stream. And before I go any further, let me just throw some things out there to think about. I'm keeping this in the context of wild trout streams within the Southern Appalachians, not a tailwater or a spring creek. Okay, so we're talking about strictly freestone streams that form naturally out of springs up the hollow or the um, flow out of the ground, come down and converge into much larger streams. It's gonna be a little bit of an ecology lesson, but hopefully by the end of this, this all kind of makes sense and it'll help to translate as to um, why the next time you come out, you shouldn't worry about your fly pattern as much. Now, what I've got here, and this is what I've been fishing with all morning, is I've got a dry dropper with a parachute Adams and a pheasant tail variation. That's why I fished with 99% of the time on all of the waterways here that have wild trout. The reason why I choose those two is it's really two out of the four fly patterns that I fish with more often than not. If you look at my fly boxes here, I've got my dry fly box on one side, I've got mainly parachute Adams and stimulator variations. On the other side, I've got mainly terrestrials. It's a little low right now, but I've got some uh, interesting conceptions of beetles and ants and grasshoppers. Interesting because there's not really many in there that look exactly like a beetle or a grasshopper. Um, same thing with my nymph box here. So with my nymph box, it looks like there's about 20 or 30 variations of flies, which there are, but they're really just fancy versions of a pheasant tail and a hare's ear. So basically what I just showed you all there was four flies, pheasant tail, parachute atoms, hare's ear, and a stimulator. When it comes to dry flies and nymphs, that's really about all I fish with around here. And the reason for it actually goes back to uh, the ecology of the area. Um, due to the rock type and the soil type that's here, the water is actually slightly acidic. Because um, the water flows through the ground as it infiltrates through rainfall, it comes back up um, through the aquifer, and pops out of the spring. As that water flows and it moves its way through very porous rock and soil, um, it's picking up slight trace amounts of carbonic acid. And by the time it reaches this point here, the water pH should be roughly around a 6.8. Now what that translates into, comparing it to, you know, like a tailwater or a spring creek, is that that slight acidity to the water makes the amount of bug life in here less diverse and less substantial. So, you know, if we were to pick up a rock in here, yeah, we would find probably 10 mayflies under it, but they might be one species of blue wing olive, one PMD, one March brown, whatever, right? You're not really gonna find a high amount of any one of those insects. Now, that doesn't mean that the fishing around here is bad because of it. Um, it just means that things happen a little bit slower around here. So, comparing it to a tailwater, for instance, um, the growth rates in tailwater is because of the high amount of bug life that's in there is pretty substantial. In here, a seven inch long trout is four years old, give or take a couple years. Um, and if you think about it, that's a long time for any sort of animal to reach just, you know, roughly seven inches long, right? So, you know, that fish in the time that it's spent in here is very well educated and has had to survive a lot of different things. It's had to survive floods, droughts, herons, ospreys, uh, otters, people trying to catch them and eat them. I mean, these fish are survivors. And since they're born and bred in the stream and not just a dumb stalker, they know what a real fly looks like as it's drifting down through the current. But because of that low amount of biodiversity of aquatic insects, that actually plays into the angler's advantage in that sense of actually picking out a fly pattern because in reality, it doesn't really matter that much. If you go out on a trout stream, you pick up a rock and you see a bunch of small flies and you see like a bunch of little blue, like size 16 blue wing olives flying around, just put on a olive colored parachute atoms and a small pheasant tail and go have fun. Um, but what it comes down to actually catching the fish, that's what makes the presentation part the key. Because again, these fish are not dumb. They're very well educated. They know exactly what a real bug's supposed to look like. And if you don't imitate your flies to match those natural insects, you're not gonna catch anything. Um, quick story here. So one of my biggest influences growing up was my great grandfather. And he was not a fly fishing purist. He fished with rooster tails just about as much as anything else when the time was right, because he saw everything as sort of like a, a tool in the arsenal, if you will. 
but one of the things he taught me growing up is that if you've known you presented everything correctly, you should only fish a run three times and then move up. If you didn't get any, move up to the next one, fish that spot. And, you know, that's sort of perplexing to people because I've seen, you know, some beginner and immediate anglers stand in the same spot for 30 minutes to an hour and, you know, eventually catch one because that one drift they happened to make actually happened to look halfway natural. The biggest piece of advice I can give when it comes to fishing around here is to not worry about your fly pattern so much. If you've got a pheasant tail, if you've got a parachute atoms, you've basically got the two best flies that you could have to fish anywhere within the southeast. Um, what it comes down to, though, is learning how to present those flies correctly. Um, whether it be, you know, learning how to actually cast that dry fly to get it to drift and look natural, or as what I do most of the time is just simply high stick everything. Um, it eliminates drag, it eliminates the need to mend, and everything just looks a lot more natural and you end up catching a lot more fish. Um, to put that in perspective, I took those two flies a day. It's flies I've always fished with. Um, hit, you know, everything as good as I could and I caught 20 fish this morning. So, you know, with that being said, again, don't worry about your fly pattern so much. Focus on that presentation and then good things will follow. Um, hope that helped y'all out a little bit. It's just been something that's been on my mind and I kind of wanted to to share that with y'all. Um, if you have any other questions or any ideas for more things you'd like to see us put out on videos, feel free to leave a comment below or just give us a holler at southernappalachianglers.com or our Instagram page. Hope to see y'all on the water soon and tight line.